Welcome to the aggressive life, gravitas. What is spiritual gravitas? It's a thing. It's an important thing. You want it. You you know it when you've been around it. I got to talk to a bunch of high schoolers about this, and this talk applies to everybody all ages. The wave always starts in the student section, period. It's critical. Earlier this year, I was asked to speak at a gathering of student influencers, teenagers who are integral to to running the student ministries and reaching their peers across all of our Crossroads sites. And despite the fact that my calendar was crammed full, I made it a point to get out there and spend time with them because that's how important students are. They're not just the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today. All of Jesus' disciples were 18 and under other than, other than Peter. I don't know if you knew that or not. Just Peter was. We know it because one of the miracles of Christ. Do I talk about this in this talk? I think you do. Yeah, we'll just save it for the talk. I'll just save it for the talk. Good. Let's just like stop it. right there. Thanks, sir. We'll stop right there. And if I don't talk about the talk, you can you can ask a QA and a and I'll, I'll tell you about it later. <laughs> anyway, enough talking about what I talked about, Dirt. <laughs> Let's get to the talk. Let's go and talk about the power of developing spiritual gravitas, which is a critical thing for all of us. It's recorded on an iPhone. Uh, Dirt wasn't there. I just took my iPhone and said, oh, this might be good to use. So I record it on the iPhone. The sound quality isn't amazing, but whether you're 17 or 75, I think there's something here for all of us. Let's go. I'm going to go in the deep end with you guys today. Are you okay, Matt? Well, you're going to get that anyway. I came to Christ when I was about your age, 15, 16 years old, and and uh, very thankful that I did. And I was in student ministry. I thought student ministry was going to be my life. And then God called me into doing something different, and I get the opportunity to support our student ministry at Crossroads, hiring great staff. How about all the staff that you have here? That's great. great volunteers who are adults who are coming, and all of you. And I, I just knew that supporting student ministry was critical because student ministry, when you're around students, you are closer to the movement of Christ than you are virtually anything else in the church. Let me say it again. When you're with students, you're closer to the move of Christ than you are virtually anything in the church. It's because you're the age of the original 12 disciples. I don't know if you knew that or not. Many things that Hollywood does, they get it wrong because they show the disciples as you know, 30 year olds, 40 year olds. Same as when you watch old World War II movies, they show all these army guys that were driving tanks as like 30 year olds. No, those, those dudes driving tanks were 17. They were 18. That's what they were. And in and, and the, and the Bible, we, we get a clue over how old the disciples were. It's one of the miracles. It comes to the book of Matthew, chapter 17, verse 24 and following. Here's what it says. After Jesus and his disciples arrived in Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma temple tax came to Peter and asked, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Your religious people are always looking for a reason that you're not towing the line. Religious people are always telling you what you should or shouldn't do, which is one of the great things about student ministry is there's, there tends to be a bit less rules. You get to do stupid, crazy stuff, whereas in much of the other church world, those things are frowned on because religious people, church-going people, are always going, you can't do that, you can't do that, no, stop, stop, you can't do it. So they're just on top of you saying, hey, 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 you got to pay your tax. You got to pay your tax. Well, why aren't you paying taxes? Uh, and he says this, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? And Peter says, uh, yes, he does, he replied. And when Peter came into the house, Jesus was the first to speak. What do you think, Simon? And he asked, hmm, from whom do the kings of the earth collect duty and taxes? From their own children or from others? He said, from others, Peter said. Then the children are exempt, Jesus said to him. Jesus says, look, in the ancient culture, you tax people who aren't citizens. You don't tax your own citizens in ancient culture. Jesus says, we are citizens of the kingdom of God, so we pay no taxes to God. But let's keep the uh, customs and let's pay them what they need to pay them. So they have a miracle. They go down and they fish and they get a fish and inside the fish, 
there's a trachma. And Jesus says to Peter, now take that, take, that, uh, take that coin that was in the fish's mouth and pay the temple tax for you and I. You only had to pay the temple tax if you were 19 and over. So none of the other disciples have to pay the tax because they're all 18 and under. Think about that. You have the potential for whatever potency the original disciples have. You're in it right now, like right now. Not like you have to go to college and you have to go to seminary. And you've got to read the Bible three, three more times. The disciples never read the whole Bible. They didn't have the Bible. They didn't have the New Testament. Right now, you have the ability to have power and potency and impact the world the same way the disciples did. And the great thing is, you're not you're young enough that you can actually believe it. Because when you get older, you get jaded. And you just get the tar kicked out of you. And you get uh, more cynical. But you all have a bit less of that. Now, if you have the same stuff to change the world the disciples have, the thing is, you're going to have to live differently than the rest of the world. If you have the same stuff to change the world, you're going to have to live differently than the rest of the world. And that's the, that's the thing. Most people don't want to live differently. We just want to have a veneer of spirituality and a veneer of belief and just have the life that everybody else has. But if you want to change the world, you're going to have to live differently. You're going to, have to, you're going to, have to change your world. And this, it doesn't mean you have to do horrible things that are awful for your life. It doesn't mean you have to memorize a chapter of the Bible a day. It just means you have to notice that the things that's happening in the world, they don't work. Your generation has the highest levels of anxiety of any generation in American history. Your generation has more depressions, more suicides than any generation in all of history. It's not because you're weaker as of your DNA, it's that you are being force fed and you are swallowing things that previous generations didn't have to do. I, I, I'm sorry if I'm going someplace where your, your leaders go all the time, but I felt this is what God wanted me to say. I'm not sure if you're aware that the, the data is very, 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 very clear. Very clear. Like Jonathan Haidt out of Stanford has nailed this down, and uh, there's a movement underfoot to age gate social media for you and your age. Are you familiar with this? Like to, to say nobody under 18 can use social media. And the reason is, the statistics are very clear, especially in young women, that's all of you in here, your suicide and anxiety uh, statistics are off the chart relative to people who don't use social media. Off the chart, and you can see very clearly when Facebook and Instagram came into being, is just skyrocketing. And so there's a lot of people who are saying, wait a minute, we age-gated tobacco because we saw it was hurting and killing young people we have the same data that's telling us our young people cannot deal with the pressure of conforming to everybody. Our young people cannot deal with the pressure of they're having an experience that I don't have. Our young people cannot deal with the pressure of feeling like they're missing out on life. Somebody's getting ahead of them. Oh no, I'm, I'm behind. Oh no, I didn't have this. I couldn't have dealt with that. That's for donor service. No way I could have dealt with that. And the statistics are clear that, that, that you, can't, you can't either. You're not anyway. You're not doing that. I'm not saying you're not strong enough to do it. I'm just saying statistics, it's very, very, very clear. I mean, most of you, if you said, would you be okay? You'd snap your fingers and all social media go away for everybody. You're not left out of it. You're not behind. You're not, you don't, you don't, you're not out of the click because some people are like, if, if it just went away, if everybody, everybody goes gone. I think most would say, oh, that'd be really refreshing. <laughs> not 50% of them, not if, you know, most people still have it, but you're the one who doesn't have it. The pressure thing. Why is it, why is it, this is not an anti-social media talk, by the way. I use social media all the time, I like social media. What this is, is this is, this is an anti-living the way everybody else lives talk. The problem with so much in our world is it keeps us from connecting with God. You and I are not human doings, we are human beings. We're not here to do and accomplish, it. we're here to, to be, be in a relationship with God. We learned something in the very first chapter in the Bible, the creation narrative, on, on 
day one, God creates the things on day one, then it says, God, God looks at it and says, and it was good. Day two, and it was good. All these things are being created, lights being created, lands being created, water, animals, and it was good, and it was good. And the sixth day, he creates men and women, men and women, and then, you know what happens on day seven? Nothing, yeah, rest, rest. God rests from his labors, but humans rest for their labors. You would think that God is, God, men and women created Adam and Eve. Like, okay, I need you guys to help me here. I got some animals that need named. I got some land that needs to be tilled. I got some seeds that need planted. We got, we got stuff to do. But instead, the very first day of their existence is rest. <sighs> rest. The power of your life will come out of your ability to rest. The power of your life will not come out of your ability to consume content and read books, that is not the power of your life. The power of your life comes from your ability to rest. Because when you rest, God can speak and you can restore yourself and you can have breakthrough ideas. I have a friend of mine who ran the neuroscience lab at the National Institute of Health. The top thing in the land that dealt with neuroscience and all the chemicals and everything. And he said, so he said something pretty interesting. He said the most, the hardest working people in the lab, the people who were there six, seven days a week, all hours a night, he said they were the least effective people. So what do you mean least effective? Well, I said, he said, well, they, they filled out their charts and they had a lot of work done. You could see their stuff, but they never had any breakthroughs. I said, really? I said, no, no, because the brain is wired such that you got to shut the circuits down. You know, our brain chemistry is constantly bubbling, the synaptic connections are, you know, a millimeter or a fraction millimeter apart or barely touching and there's a little spark that's going between there and as our chemistry and our, all the stuff is flowing through our thing, what happens is we actually get ruts in our thinking. You literally get a rut in your mind where your chemicals are going the same way all the time, going and going and going and to have a breakthrough, you have to break out of your normal ruts of thinking. And Keith, the way he said what it was, because these are all electric, electrical charges in our brain, he said, you have to shut the circuits down. You gotta shut them down. He said the people who had sane work schedules and weren't always on, they had the creative breakthroughs. They were able to find things in the brain and discover things that the people who were always on never could. Why is that? It's because God told us to rest. When we rest, we can have creative breakthroughs. When we get away from the crunch of being consumed with other, what other people think about us, we can recharge. I had a speaker one time say to me, or say to us, as a group, someone of this when I, was in, when I was in high school, he said, you know, the people who are the center of your world right now, that you think are so important and you live to impress, or the most popular people in your school that you want to them to admire you and to include you. He said, it's what's so crazy is we all want to be in the in crowd and live for these people. And he said this, he said, in 15 years, you won't even remember their names. I was like, what? Oh, that's ridiculous. It's true. It's true. It's nuts. It's, and it's still nuts too. How often I still think of some of the people I was with, even though I haven't seen them for 30, 40 years. It's just... It, it, it consumes us. And those relationships are all that time. As fun and as innocent as it is, those aren't the relationships that are going to define us. The relationship that's going to define us is the relationship we have with our God. The relationship we have with our friends who actually know God. There's a, there's a, um, a word by the name of gravitas. You know this word, gravitas? Gravitas is weightiness. How many of you saw the, the, the eclipse? Anybody go see the eclipse? I don't, mean, I don't mean like saw it from your house where it was 95%. I mean drove someplace where it was 100%. How many of us? Okay, good number of us. It's kind of crazy. As I was sitting there watching it, that they could predict when the eclipse was going to happen, exactly where it was going to happen. I mean, really, really, really not so. Think about that. They, in fact, they know hundreds of years in the future where the next one is going to be and where it's going to be and what time. I mean, math, science is mind-blowing. 
For science to work and to make predictions, it must be predictable. Why is that predictable? Let's have a little group thing here. Why can they predict when the next eclipse is? Eclipse is. What, what makes it so predictable? This is time for open discussion. Idea. Because it's always following a steady path. It's always following a steady path. True. Always following a steady path. What else? What's with it? Why is it always following a steady path? So you follow that, That's right. That's right answer. Well, why is it following the steady path? Okay, gravity. And why does gravity have the impact of that? Well, that's always the answer. God made it. That, that is true. That, that's very true. That's right. That's right. Not the answer I'm looking for. What else? What else? Why is gravity... How does gravity create predictability? Yeah. It's already like, happened in the past. Already happened in the past? Uh, that's good philosophy. Oh, I don't want to go there. Good, good idea. No, not, not, no. No, not the answer. Not I hate when you give me a good answer and I say no. But I'm just going to say no. All right, I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you what it is. Gravity... The heart of gravity is the larger the mass, the more it sucks things to it. Okay? And the reason why it's in a straight line, straight line or predictable path, I think you said, is because the Earth has to go around the sun because of the gravitational pull of the sun, because the sun has mass. The sun has weight. The sun has gravitas, if you will. And the moon has to go around the earth because the earth has more mass. It has more weight. It revolves around. So then it's just a matter of doing the math of, because we know the sun is going to be stable, and we know the earth is coming here, and the, the moon, so therefore we always can figure that out. Because the predictable thing is the word I'm using, mass, gravitas, or this spiritual weight. If you've not met somebody who has spiritual weight to them, you don't know what it is, you just want to like be around them. You don't know what it is, the people are sort of circling them. They're the kind of people, they say something that somebody else could say, but it wouldn't hit the same way. You know what I'm talking about here? You've been around somebody who, who just their presence is comforting when somebody else's presence would be like, oh, it's fine. The reason that is, is because of somebody's spiritual mass because of their gravitas. That's why. If there's any reason why students aren't getting higher in the impact of the kingdom, because age-wise you're qualified, if there's any reason why you're not more so than you are right now, it's just you may not have had the years to accumulate spiritual mass, or right now you're living like everybody else, trying to be like everybody else, and there's zero spiritual power in your life. There's zero sense of abiding and having a sense of calm and a sense of God's presence in the life. A couple weeks ago, I did a, a motorcycle trip with a guy. He said, hey, um, he said, um, my wife is having a hard time getting pregnant. I said, well, if, uh, if you want to, um, if you want, I'll, uh, I'll, pray, I'll pray for her. I've actually got a pretty good hit rate and um, Crossroads was about five years old and we were doing, I was doing an infant baptism, infant dedication because we give Christian parents the choice they want to dedicate their child or baptize their child. Just saying basic phrases, one's water and one isn't. I don't want to get into a whole theology thing here. But this woman came, this, this couple came up to me and said, uh, you know, you, we came, we, we came up to you after, sir, after church one day and we asked you if uh, if you would pray for us, because we were, we were in infertility prob problems. And they said, we did the math when, we're, when, when the child was born. It was to the day when you prayed for us. And I've had a number of those things happen. Uh, so I said, this, I said to my buddy, I, uh, I said, look, hey man, buddy, I've known him at this point for six days on the trail. I said, I've, I've got a fairly good hit rate, or God has a fairly good hit rate of using my prayers for whatever reason. And uh, if you want to help me pray for your wife, I'll, I'll pray for your wife. She said, uh, okay, good. Uh, I said, come down after the next service. I said, fine. So a week or so later, uh, I was too worn out after the services. And sometimes I just don't stand down front because I'm just, I'm, I'm worn out. And if somebody comes down, I could just say something really stupid and sensitive. So as a, as a way to not bum other people out, I sometimes exit the end of the stage because I'm just spent. 
this was one of those days I just exited backstage. I didn't come down and hang front. And then he, he texted me, said, hey, my wife and I are here. And who? Okay, this is uh, good. I want, come backstage, come where I am, gave me directions. When I got together with them, I said to, I said to them, so this is really good news because you have initiated this. That's good. I counted in the New Testament 41 miracles that Jesus gives. 41. 41 times he heals somebody. 34 of the 41 times it's initiated. The person has to initiate. So if you think Jesus was going to come to the city and just walk through the hospitals and heal people, that's not what he would do. He would want to see who's, who wants it. Who's hungry? Of the remaining seven, seven of the remaining ones, in five of those cases, he makes them do something still. Step out. Walk down and wash your face off. The point here is, if you want a miracle, you have to be willing to move. Just passively sitting back, hoping God dips his sweet sugar finger in your life, doesn't work. And so I said to him, good news is, you've already, you've already cleared the first hurdle. You've shown that you wanted it. You searched me out. And so I put my hand on her. I said, okay, if I put my hand on her, put my hand on her belly, had one finger on her, on her belt buckle, and I'm praying, I'm praying, and, and all of a sudden, there's movements inside her, inside her belly, and there's heat, massive heat. And I said, do you, do you feel that right now? And she said, uh, yes, I do, and she bursted out in tears. I said, it doesn't feel like um, an upset stomach or something like that. And I said, no, it's, it's not. It's not. I said, okay. So uh, we, we ended in prayer, and that was uh, three weeks ago. So I don't know what's happened since. But I reflected on that a lot, and I thought, maybe she, maybe she, con maybe she conceived, or she miss of conceiving. Maybe she did, but something happened. What, what was that? And I thought, was it the Spirit of God? I hope so. I think so. It could also have been my faith was larger because I have greater faith to pray for that, because I've seen God say yes to those things than I do to pray for other things. It could also have been her feelings was that she was around my weight, my gravitas. And being around the gravitas was, I'm not God, I'm not God, but I have the Holy Spirit. And you can too if you don't. And it could be that she was just picking up on the weightiness that was causing her to come down. You want weightiness? You want, you want gravitas? For no purpose other than you want the presence of God in your life and you want God to do for and in you what you can't do for and in yourself? Do you want the gravitas that enables you to disciple other people, to lead other people to Christ? That's what, that's what that mass is for. Everything that Jesus gives us in the Bible is to is to accomplish the Great Commission. Go into all the world, baptizing people, making disciples. If we're on a journey with our faith to just actualize ourselves, our faith is going to be dead. Our faith is about other people. Our faith is about God. Our faith is about the call of God. Our faith is about the purpose of God. Our faith is about the vision of God. Our faith is about what God wants done in other people, not just myself. I want God to do things in me so I can bless other people. People of gravitas get this. We understand this. And we want to grow in that mass. If you're here as a leader, you're not here because of your personality. Though you may have a great personality. You're here because this ministry needs you to be a person of weight. It needs to be a person of mass. This ministry needs you to be different from other people. It needs you to not take your cues from culture on what's right and what's wrong. It needs you to have a different emotional and psychological makeup. It needs you to, to be more hardy. And how can you be more hardy? Not by sucking it up, you're more hardy because you're spending more time with the one who creates things. Now what he said is good, it's good. One of the, one of the greatest miracles I ever had in my life, and one of the hardest was riding a uh, rented Harley Davidson motorcycle 80 miles an hour and a uh, deer jumped out in front of me and I, I split the deer, I went right through the center of the deer, smashed the deer in the middle um, thrown off the motorcycle threw it, run in the air 40 yards and then rolled about another 20 yards on the pavement 28 miles an hour and not wearing a helmet 
people said, man, you shouldn't be wearing a helmet. And I said, no, I should be wearing gloves because I got stitches in these left two fingers. That's what I thought. So anything that happened was miraculous, really miraculous. And what I felt when I was there was I couldn't help but tell everybody in the hospital who Jesus was. <laughs> I remember the woman picked me up. She picked me up and she took me. She took me to the hospital and I'm walking there and I said, uh, get in the car and I'm just shaking up. I, you know, I got blood all over me. I've got, I've got bruises under my leathers. I have leathers on and I'm just shaking up. And at the point I was really frustrated because I wasn't seeing God do a lot of the uh, supernatural stuff in my life. I was actually a little bitter about it. So I was like 35 years old. And I realized, God said, look, this is the one that you get. Nobody else gets. I get in the car and she and I said, I asked the woman, I said, never met her before, just picked me up. I said, do you, uh, do you believe in God? She says, uh, well, yeah, don't we all? One of those manby, pamby, spiritually answers. Like, don't we all? Like, everyone has their own God. Everyone has their own higher power. Well, everyone may have their own higher power, but that isn't God. And so she said, well, don't we all? I, she got me with a raw time with God. I said, don't we all? I said, no, we do not. Let me tell you, there's one God, and his name is Jesus. And he's who just saved me on this thing. That gravitas. So I'm in that, I'm in that, in that hospital, and, and, uh, and I just couldn't help but bringing that out. And so while I was having this spiritual high... Then I have no motorcycle and I'm bruised. It's like someone just kicked the snot out of me. Even though I have leather jacket on stuff, I've got contusions and bruises because when your body lands going 80 miles an hour and rolls. Of course, as I was rolling, God's perfect geometry. When I when I hit that when I hit that deer, I had bad braking technique. I'm going to go in the weeds here a little bit. Um, it'll make sense in just a moment. Like when you're a kid, you know everyone always tells you, "What do you do with your front brakes on your bicycle as a kid?" What do they tell you? Don't use them. Don't use them. Don't use them. You're going to flip over the handlebars. That's, yes, yes. But they have those front brakes for a reason. That is because as your, as your mass is going, all the weight's on the front tire. So to stop, you've got to put some brake pressure on the front tire. Okay? I transferred that to motorcycles. So at this point, I don't really know how to motor, didn't know how to ride a motorcycle. I was riding just like I did my old bicycle, just only using back brakes, right? And so since I had the wrong brake technique, I should have put on the front brake as well as the back brake, my, my motorcycle skid like this, the back end skid, and so when I went through that deer and I came off it, I hit the ground on my perfect side like this and then rolled. If I, if I had actually proper direct brake technique and didn't stop in time, I would have gone like this and I would have pretzeled in half and broke, literally broken in half. So reflecting on all these things, and we had to stay in this hotel and we went to this uh, fly fishing shop. Actually, the guy who owned the hotel, the fly fisher, so I went on his boat the next day, and I've got bandages from, from bruises underneath my leathers. I've got stitches in my knuckles here, and, and we're, it's hot, and I'm bobbing up and down in the, in, the, in the back of the boat, and I'm trying to fish, and it's horrible. I'm a bored loser fisherman anyway. I never catch anything. And I'm just going to this pity party. This, this sucks. This is awful. It's awful. And then all of a sudden, God like nudged me like, hey, Brian, you could have a feeding tube right now. And I said, God, that's a great point. That's a great point. And I, and I committed from then on to never have a bad day because there was no day I wasn't going to have a feeding tube. <laughs> like feeding tube, whatever the pain of that day was. Pain of, I've had a lot of painful days. Not as bad as feeding tube the rest of my life. Hey, if you're a pastor, keep listening. If not, no worries, hit that skip button. Last year, I worked with Ministry Solutions to offer mentoring to pastors. Uh, it was a really great experience, and I want to do it again this fall. So if you want to do it, if you're a pastor, signups are currently open for the next group of pastors, but space is very limited. And if you're interested, you can send an email to dirt at bryantome.com. That's dirt at bryantome.com, and he will get you connected to Ministry Solutions. For all of the details, you don't have to take my word for it. My friend Roby, who was in my cohort last year, said this. He said, quote, my time in the cohort was a game changer in my leadership. I now lead with greater freedom and boldness. I have more clarity on God's calling for me, and I am running after it more aggressively. If you're a pastor and you could use some mentorship, send that email to Dirt, and he'll get you connected. Again, that's dirt at Brian Tome. 
Bluehost.com. Now back to the show. Flying K Ranch. Today's episode is brought to you by them because I believe they're producing some of the most mouth watering, healthy burgers, steaks, roasts I've ever had. They're in Findlay, Ohio. Flying K raises their beef with no hormones or antibiotics, so you know you're getting the most natural product. It's a family business partnering with state and national certification boards to ensure both cattle and customers are happy. You can find out more, place your orders at Flying K Ranch Angus.com. That's flying K Ranch Angus.com. I'm liking it a lot. <laughs> Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should be at least simple. That's why for the last two years I've been drinking AG1 every day, no exceptions, at home, on a hunting trip. Camping off my motorcycle, no exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, and it makes me feel ready to get moving. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre- and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. I like to have it in the morning. I have a 12 ounce of water, so right off the bat, I'm, I'm helping my hydration every single morning. This is the one product, if I had to recommend one, I'd recommend this one to elevate your health. It's AG1, and that's why I partnered with them for two years. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash aggressive life. That's drink ag one dot com slash aggressive life get yourself some let's go back to matthew let me give you one more verse today matthew 6 25 this is the uh this is the part in the bible that seems unrealistic to us but it's really not it's just not being done you can do this there's things in the Bible that you actually can do that we don't think you can do. Like, you can take a Sabbath. One day out of seven, you can rest, and you can not work, and you can not do social media, and you can not do your emails. You could just rest and chill. You could do that. The fact of the matter is very, very, very few people do that. The people who do things in the Bible are the people who have the, the gravitas, have the weights. Here's another one. This sounds really unrealistic, but, but check this out. 625. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds in the air. They don't sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worry, add a single hour to your life? You know, the same Bible that tells us, do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not lie. It also says, do not be anxious. You know, it's possible to not be anxious. It's not possible the way our world operates. It's like, it's not possible to be in shape if you eat five Big Macs and cheese curls. I had two packs of cheese curls earlier. They're wonderful. God bless America. <laughs> It's not, it's not possible to be in shape if you just lie around like a slug. It's just not possible. And it's not possible to be anxiety-free if you do what everybody else is doing, which is not take a rest, not unplug, not sit with God, not, not look to God for your worth instead of other people you're worth. But Jesus has this as an expectation. Let's keep going. And why do you worry about clothes? Worry about food, worry about clothes. See how the flowers of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not so, even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed up like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass in the field, which is here today and gone tomorrow, and thrown into the fire, will he not yet clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Very few of us in here have gone without food for long periods of time and hungry. Very few of us in here have ever been naked. 
um, unwillfully naked rather, very free, very, very few of us have. And, and, and Jesus said, it's the way it works. It just works out, doesn't it? It works out that you have something to eat. It works out that you're, you're warm. It, it just, pretty much your whole life is here. It's a testimony that God has worked everything out, all your pain. It's still there. I'm not telling you you're not pain. I'm not saying you don't have emotional turmoil and things that have been done to you that regret. And they I'm, I'm not saying that those things aren't real and they're not important and have to be dealt with. I'm just saying, I think all of us holistic can say, hmm, I'm still here. God's brought me this far. This is the key thing to overcoming anxiety. To see the presence in the biography of God. Let's keep going here. Or do not, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans, the pagans, run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He knows that we need these things. But what happens with is the pagans, those are people who are not, do not have spiritual gravitas, they run after everything that social media tells us we have to have. They run after all the bolt-on truck parts that I have to have in my truck. All the new motorcycle guy. They run after them. Run after all of the all the new workout plans. They, they run they're, because you're either running after those things or you're running after God. And you can have those things and have God. But I'm asking you, what do you run after? What do you want? Seriously, if you want to be a disciple of Christ and want to be a world changer, what do you want? Do you want what everybody else has, or do you want something different? Do you want the same mamby pamby flimsy life that people get blown all over the place based on public opinion? Or do you want God? Do you want what God wants? Do you want, do you want, do you want a relationship with God where you just go, yeah, well, if it's your will, or do you want a relationship with God where you feel him well enough you say, God, I'm asking for a healing right now, and you have some semblance of confidence he's going to come through because you walk with him the way that other mere mortals don't. Because you actually believe that God is real. You believe he saved you. You believe he has a purpose for you. And you're living that way right now. That's why the disciples are so powerful. It wasn't because they were young. It's because of the way they lived their life. Your youth doesn't mean anything. Who cares if you're young? It's a matter of how you live your life. Are you living your life like Jesus? Are you living your life like the disciples? They're having actual gravitas, actual weight to your life. And then people actually listen to you and they don't even know why they listen to you. And then you enter a room and for some reason people know you've entered your bed. You've been like that? When certain people enter a room, it's like you can feel it in the room. You've been around somebody like that? That's not charisma for a lot of folks. That's not mere Charisma can do that. But there's a kind of person who lights up a room because they have the light of Christ inside of them. Deep abiding light. And when they walk in, you know it. Do you know anybody like this? Maybe you don't. Okay. Are you, do you know anybody like this? Yes, yes, okay. Hope so, good. If you don't know anybody like this, then I hope you find someone because they can be a model for you of how to develop your own self. Let's keep going. Almost over here. Seek first, this is Jesus, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Clothing is important, food's important, drink's important. But seek first the kingdom of God. And all these things will come. It's not bad to have truck parts, motorcycles, I don't know, makeup products, whatever. I don't know. Not, not bad to have either. But are we seeking those things? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. 365 times the Bible tells us to not worry and have no anxiety. 365 times. That, that, that number sound familiar? Number of days in a year. How do we know it's number of days in a year? Because the mass and the weight of the, of, of the sun, how long it takes to go around it. That's why. That's how we know. There is mass to this. In 365 days, we remember not fear. Because every time I fear, it's, it's a sign that I don't trust God. Every time I fear, it's a sign that I'm believing what I'm seeing instead of the unseen faith that Jesus will take care of me. Every time I have fear and I'm freaking out, it's a moment of saying that God isn't in control. He is in control. Jesus actually says there, don't worry about tomorrow. You remember what it says? Don't worry about tomorrow. Why? Why, why not worry about tomorrow? Right. And today has its own worries. <laughs> 
Jesus didn't say you're not going to have trouble. He's saying deal with the real trouble today. Today. This is not one of the happy, happy, clappy verses we like to think of. Jesus here is promising us trouble. That's what he's promising us. But he's also promising us that we'll be able to handle it. Because God can handle it. Back to the back to the eclipse, I'm gonna end with this. I'll end with this. You know, I came in here thinking, I know the I know the um, I know the template how to give a great talk to students. I did it for a long time, going to camps all the time. I know I know the template. And I know I'm kind of breaking it right now. At least the old template, I know the old template. You know, get them laughing, talk about boogers, all kind of stuff like that. You see? You just you just respond to it. See, I, I know I know all those things. Just you know, do some junior high humor, do you know, I, I know the template and I agree with the template and it's good. I came in here today going, I'm not doing the template. I've come in here today to talk to leaders. That's what I was told. It's a leadership retreat. I didn't come here to, to talk with all of your friends and everybody else. I, you're supposed to be leaders, okay? So I'm talking to you like leaders. Like people who are in the heritage of Peter, Paul, James. That's how I'm talking to you today. There's two kind of folks with the eclipse who saw the eclipse. There's some of us who went out of our way to get in that little path where it was 100% eclipse, eclipse. And then others, for whatever understandable reason, who didn't. When I went to last eclipse in 2017, and I went to an Indiana, I drove to see it, to be in the path. I was so awestruck by what I saw because, uh, you know, it goes dark. The birds, if you're around a bunch of wooded areas, the birds go, oh, it's nighttime. Well, I guess we got to shut up and go to bed. And then the crickets, the crickets go, hey, it's nighttime. Let's come out and start chirping. <laughs> Temperature drops 10, 15 degrees immediately. And there's just, it was just one of those eerie, calm things that was... It was transcendent, best word for it. And so I did everything I could coming up in this current eclipse through my social media platforms and stuff, telling people, wherever you can, get to 100%. Get, get get there. Get there, get there, get there, get there. And when I talked to him, I said, did you see the eclipse? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, where, 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 where did you see it? I saw it in uh, my backyard. It was, it said, it was, it was, I, it was 99%. It was, it was really cool. And my heart just kind of sinks. Because unless you've been to 100%, you haven't seen the eclipse. And only people here went to where it was 100% know what I'm talking about. At 99%, as cool as it would have been if you had those glasses to see the moon go in front of the sun, you still had light. You still didn't have the, the tricky effects that happen with your psyche and everything like that. There's a magical thing when it's fully blocked out at 100% that you don't have at 99%. A lot of people think 99% falling Christ is pretty good. A lot of people think 50% is falling good. Let me tell you, it's not. It's not. It's nothing. It's nothing. It is. If you may be more spiritual than the 20 percenter. You, you may be doing things with somebody else, but I'm telling you, there's a level in your gravitas, a weight that you only get when you're 100%. 100% in. And this is why the disciples turned the world upside down. It wasn't because they were young and had energy. It's because they were 100% in. It wasn't mean, didn't mean they were perfect. They made mistakes. Many, 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 many. And you know what they did when they made mistakes? What you guys you just did yesterday. It was early on. They repented. I'm, I'm 100. And I still repent. <laughs> I said, oh man, I just, oof. I just, let's get, let's get back to 100. Let's repent. Let's tell God sorry. Let's, let's recognize it. Let, let's tell somebody else. Let's not have anything have anything hidden. Do not buy this lie that 99 is good enough. It's not. It's not the way of Jesus. It's not how you overcome the world. It's not how you get over your fears and anxiety. It's not how you have gravitas. It's not how you have a great prayer life. It's 100%. And if you're going to be a leader, you've got to be 100% fully eclipsed by Christ. Fully. Doesn't matter what everybody else has. Doesn't matter what God's doing with everybody else. Doesn't matter what that does. It matters you. Just you and God. It's personal. It's personal. You and Him. And He knows. Doesn't matter if you get caught or if it goes on social media or not. He knows. And you want Him to know. Not because you want to be Mr. or Mrs. Moral and goody two-shoes and do all the right things. It's fine to do that. 
But no, it's because it's a personal relationship with God. And you want Him to eclipse you. And so therefore, you've got to be 100% in on Him and nothing else. You do that, anxiety will go away. Fear will go away. Purposeless will go away. And a clarity about your focus and the depth to your relationships and the power to your prayer life becomes. That's all I got. I'm done. <laughs>